to catch you up because uh, it has been a while since we had this class because Monty was teaching and giving me a break, which I appreciate very much, sir. At, uh, I see you get all cleaned up after you're done teaching. I, I don't, we'll talk about that. But we had begun a very important section in our study of the second century church and their efforts to, just like us, be the church of the first century. And we, we've done the first lesson in this selection, which was uh, Solo Fidelis. And uh, looking for recognition in anybody's eyes. Uh, there are two sets, so that's not bad. <laughs> uh, Solo Fidelis is, of course, uh, faith only. And that's the term that didn't exist before as a term. Uh, before Martin Luther. So this is Martin Luther's baby. There was a lot of other scholars that did contribute to it. Uh, who's the guy with the Z twain? Zingley, Zingler, or somebody like that? That guy. Uh, I just call him uh, Mr. Z. Uh, but uh, he, he had uh, a lot to do with it. Him and Martin Luther were friends. But the bottom line is, here is uh, the church, some 17 years old or so, and all of a sudden we find out, and it was uh, that, oh, this is the right way. So what you see there, of course, again, is the overcorrection as we try for balance. So who was Martin Luther really upset with? The Catholic Church. So we all know how he nailed his theses on the door at Wittenberg, etc. Uh, but of course, the Catholic Church at that point had perverted the truth of the gospel a great deal. But in trying to correct that, uh, of course, Luther swung too hard to the other side and decided you don't have anything to do with your salvation, uh, which is we're going to see this morning uh, was a pretty hard sell, uh, but he was very successful in it, and of course that's a, a mainstay of many Christian groups today uh, to uh, believe that in that error, uh, but I just uh, tried to highlight uh, a few things here from that lesson. So this is not that lesson. It's just a, a quick overview. So uh, basically, as we looked at what the second century church lived, practiced, and wrote on the subject, we saw that they very much stand pretty much where we stand in that they believe salvation begins and ends with grace but in the middle is man's faithful and obedient response. So it's very foolish, by the way, to try and put a percentage, like I see people do from time to time. Oh, God did 99%, we do, we do 1%, whatever. The truth is there is no good way to represent it uh, because it's not a business deal. And anytime you break it down to numbers, you're basically trying to equate it with a business deal, even if God is by far the most generous one in the deal. But it's not a business deal. You know, it, it's God's grace to make a way, and yet God's honoring the free will that he gave to men uh, to be able to choose whether they would be saved or not. So we'll see a lot of that. Uh, so basically, again, get those to pop up for us real quick. Uh, we see in, uh, in Luther's work, uh, Calvin uh, comes in and basically creates uh, uh, the group that, uh, of course, goes by the term. And as we've said many times, even if a group today does not consider themselves uh, to be following Calvinism, 
Uh, it's generally just because they don't know what they're doing themselves as far as uh, where their doctrines and practices come from, and they don't come from the first century. Uh, they, they come from, from Calvin. Uh, so we talked about the, the tulip uh, uh, acrostic there. It's a total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of saints. And the reason why this whole section is set apart in the class the way that I did it is because these are all things that are very relevant to the salvation issue. You know, I told you in the beginning, we'll see a lot of things and a lot of cultural things, et cetera, and, and we'll touch on things that we can't say for sure what God's will in it because he didn't, he didn't tell us, you know. But when it comes to anything pertaining to salvation, he very much did tell us and, uh, as we say all the time, went overboard <laughs> in trying to teach us. Uh, so, let's see, that's nothing we want today. Alright, this was the homework I gave you. Did anyone besides Twain do the homework? I was afraid of that. Um, listen, <laughs> yeah, I, it doesn't help in this situation. Let's just uh, look at a couple of these really quick. And I apologize ahead of time. I uh, ran off and forgot my Bible this morning. Uh, so I'm in one of my other Bibles that is not uh, preset according to the passages. But we should have, yes, Galatians 6, 9 up there. Uh, and basically we just want to get started on each of these passages because some of them are, are lengthy. Uh, but we want to see this trend basically. So Galatians 6, 9 and following says, let, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So implied in that in, in the following up uh, verse as well, so then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So here is a, a passage. If, uh, if we grow weary, then we fall away. We apostatize. And so you can see in there, uh, you know, a rebuttal against the, the thought that man doesn't have free will. Yeah, that passage very clearly indicates you have a choice as to whether you're going to get busy and do do good while you have the opportunity uh, or not. You know? And there are just so many passages on that subject. I just skimmed some of the highlights for you to kind of re reaffirm those things and help you to get an overall picture of how frequently the, the free will issue is demonstrated in the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, so we tend to take it for granted because uh, we don't have that, uh, that uh, erroneous doctrine, but you should be familiar with the weight of how many times the Bible does address free will and shows clearly that you do have free will. Why is that important? Because as we're going to see this morning, there are a couple of places where it looks like you don't have free will. And so if you're, if you're trying to study with someone on this subject that believes we don't have free will, then they're going to throw those, you know, handful of verses up uh, so you need to be aware that that is a, an area where 90% of the references are in favor of free will. You know, yes, there are 10% that if you just take out of context, you, you might get a, a belief that you don't have it. Uh, but that's like one out of, for every 10 verses that indicate that, 
you know, there's only one verse to make you stop and say, now, wait a minute, do we or, or do we not? So that's just a good list to look at. All right, let's look at this uh, predestination issue then, since this is one of the ones. Uh, this is the meaning of the word arbitrary. Uh, so arbitrary means not fixed by rules, but left to one's judgment or choice. Discretionary, as in an arbitrary decision or arbitrary judgments. So uh, anything that's arbitrary is going to be based on one's preference, his, his notion, his whim. And again, these are just uh, actual definitions, etc. So capricious. I do like the, the last one there, young children, example, young children and their arbitrary rules for games, you know. If you've ever tried to get uh, involved in a four-year-old's games, uh, you know, the, the rules change while you're in the middle of the game. Uh, and they seem to always favor the four-year-old. But uh, that's a pretty good use for the vein in which uh, it's used by Christian writers. Uh, so it's this idea of something that we choose to do. So basically, that's free will in a, in a nutshell. Now, Luther <laughs> literally defined arbitrarily as not based on any desire or faith righteousness actions or prayers on the part of the recipients so and this is one of those again that people aren't familiar with about luther's teachings you know but let me just roughly say that luther and lutherism are two different animals so the lutheran church uh, as it exists today uh, is not according to Luther. You, know? uh, you can start with the name. He himself begged them not to call themselves the Lutheran Church because he knew that was wrong, you know, but they did it anyway. So uh, as, as much of as a bad rap as we tend to give Martin Luther, uh, a lot of it is not fully deserved. It's just what his followers went ahead and did <laughs> versus what he actually taught. But he did definitely teach that you're saved by faith only. Like I said, he, uh, he coined uh, the phrase. So here's one of his quotes. And on some of these, I did try and put which of his writings it's in. Uh, this is uh, him speaking on the subject of free will here. And he says, this is the highest degree of faith to believe that he is merciful. The very one who saved so few and damns so many to believe that he is jealous the one who, according to his own will, makes us necessarily damnable. Uh, so that's him and his, the bondage of the will. Uh, Twain, how do you feel when you read a statement like that? Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of truth in there. I don't feel good about it. I mean, uh, you know, to read something like that doesn't make you all kinds of happy. Absolutely. But this is right where you want to run into the sticking point, if you will. And that what he is saying here is we don't have anything to do with our salvation, and yet we have to believe that God is just. See, this is what happens uh, when you're trying to mash a, a, a doctrine of your own making into the scriptures. Well, we've got all these... Uh, scriptures that clearly display for us that God is just, yet any person on their first brush with 
uh, this particular part of the tulip, <laughs> you know, uh, wants to say, well, hey, how can that be just if I'm damned or saved based on nothing that I had anything to do with? You know, uh, that that's an issue for even, uh, an, shall we say, a, a beginner Bible scholar. Oh, here's all this talking about the justice of God, and yet here is God just seemingly capriciously <laughs> uh, choosing who to save and who to damn. You know? So, uh, and as I've said before, I say again, Martin Luther was a tremendous scholar, and I think the church uh, doesn't acknowledge that, maybe just because we don't want to recognize that somebody who was so wrong on such a fundamental issue uh, was actually an extremely capable Bible scholar, but he was. You know. uh, but again, he was a product of his time and experiences, and he knew the way the Catholic Church was doing it was not right. You know, uh, We've talked before about the so-called sale of indulgences, which was when they needed to raise money to build, uh, I think it was St. Peter's Cathedral, one of the big cathedrals. They decided that you could sin as long as you paid them a monetary fee ahead of time and got a written hall pass saying you could do that. You know, uh, that Martin Luther was already on the edge, and that just pushed him over in his total rejection of the the Catholic Church. But uh, he did have a blind spot because he was trying to get away from a system that would say, hey, it's okay to sin if you give a donation to the church. By the way, was that really a new idea? Do you remember a case of this our Lord held up for ridicule? When he said, honor your father and mother and you're not following that command because that command specifically is addressing financially taking care of your father and mother and he says you don't follow it because you say if it it's corbin or if you got a better translation it's a gift corbin was the actual word for it uh but what Corbin was, was where you gave money to the, the temple. And so the priest said, hey, you gave the money that would have gone to take care of your poor mom and dad in their old age to the temple. Therefore, you don't have to take care of your poor mom and dad in their old age. And you're A-OK -okay with God. So it really was not a novel ideal. <laughs> when that came out uh, for him to do that. Do you have a question? Just, I had just a question. Sure. Uh, my sister takes care of my mother's father and my mother, and she's 92. And Mama didn't need help for my mom. She gets 10000 a year to help mom, even as she works full time. But we found out it was a real issue. Everything that's in it, we found out was what we never thought my sister would do. She was Those, those stories are, are always sad, but uh, I could tell, you know, several that I've witnessed along the same line, so, but, uh, you know. So what do you say to someone who does Well, when you take something that is not actually yours, it's called theft. Uh, so you might go over definitions with them. But, uh, I think it's an important point to note here that the Reformation with Martin Luther and uh, Mr. Z and the others, even Calvin, they did not teach 
that you're saved by grace alone, the way we tend to think of it looking back. They taught that you are either saved or lost based on God's arbitrary decision. And so it was grace if you were saved, but not that, uh, you know, it was faith only so much the way we boxed it. Does that make sense? We, you know, a lot of times when you look at things afterwards, especially historical movements and trends in any field, but especially uh, in, in, in the biblical field, a, a lot of it gets summed up with a sound bite that can be uh, misrepresenting. Uh, and I, I we, we've done that a little bit with this, but uh, and by the way, Calvin did not introduce this doctrine, he just popularized it. <laughs> you know, so that's good. So what did the second century church, how did they feel about it? Do you have your hand down on this one? Okay. So some do, some don't. Uh, I have to print some more if you don't, because I didn't want you to have these quotes. But this is Justin Martyr in his first apology. He says, We have learned from the prophets, and we hold it to be true, that punishments, chastisements, and rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's actions. Otherwise, if all things happen by faith, which is this concept the Reformation was putting forth, if all things happen by faith, then nothing is in our own power. For if it be predestined that one man be good and another evil, then the first is not deserving of praise or the other to be blamed. Unless humans have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, whatever they may be. For neither would a man be worthy of reward or praise if he did not himself choose the good, but was merely created for that end. Likewise, if a man were evil, he would not deserve punishment, since he was not evil of himself, being unable to do anything else than what he was made for. So, right away, when this doctrine starts popping up, the, the church understands that that can't be right. That if it were correct, think about how many passages in the Bible teach us about our choice and making those choices. And what, that's, that's all nonsense if, if there's no free will. Uh, you know, just do whatever you're you're fated to do. And uh, some parts of the New Age movement, which is very big right now, uh, grasp on to that same thought. In other words, some 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 uh, avenues of New Ageism believe that it's all fate, so you do whatever you want because it doesn't matter, it's all fated, and whatever you did do was what you were fated to do. You know? uh, but of course, all of that comes back to, I have no accountability then, because I had no power of that. What are, what are some of the biblical characters that uh, we sometimes have these type discussions about? There are two very prominent ones and I'm probably missing a half dozen. Pharaoh. How about a New Testament one? Judas. So in both those cases, they did something that was uh, prophesied. And so we come in and say, well, wait a minute. If God hardened Pharaoh and if uh, Judas had to betray Jesus, you know. So we'll uh, we'll look a little bit at some of those. We got 15 minutes left. We're doing good. Uh, this is Clement. You know, uh, neither praise nor condemnation, neither rewards nor punishments are right if the soul does not have the power of choice 
and avoidance if evil is involuntary. You think about that picture of sin in James uh, chapter 1. Each man is drawn away by his own lust. Yeah. Uh, I always like the version that says enticed away. But that's all about our free will. And it's describing how sin occurs. And, 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 by the way, what was the argument he was trying to tackle head on there? There were, there were those, even as there are some today, but there were those already teaching late in the uh, first century that uh, it wasn't, you weren't accountable for your sin because uh, it, it overpowered you, you know, and, and especially sins like lust, you know, and God made you with that sex drive and therefore it's God's fault that, you know, you do those things. So he was trying, uh, but in doing that, he covered not that just that specific sin, but gives, uh, you know, what I think is the best description of the sin process, if you will, where something attracts you, you dwell on it instead of just turning away, right, like we've talked about in the past, and then after you've dwelled on it a while, then it gets stronger and stronger. What do you know? And, and, and you do act on it and everything. Uh, but you had the choice of whether you dwelled on that. Uh, so, let's see. This is our Archelaus. And at least, you know, if you don't choose to take the weekly handouts and, and have the quotes, that's one thing. But at least make sure you keep up with that one I gave you at the beginning that tells you who and when all these people are. Uh, because a lot of these are second century, so they're very shortly after the apostles. Uh, all the creatures that God made, he made very good. We all know that, right? And he gave to every individual the sense of free will, by which standard he also instituted the law of judgment. Why does that courtroom scene occur in Genesis chapter 3? Where he has Eve and Adam and Satan, the serpent, before him. And he pronounces judgment on them all, right? Based on what? Based on their exercise of free will to, to eat the forbidden fruit. Yeah. Uh, so, from the very beginning, this is how sin works and how man is accountable for his or her choices in that. So, God made everything very good. He gave the individual the sense of free will, by which standard he also instituted the law of judgment. And certainly whoever will may keep the commandments. Whoever despises them and turns aside to what is contrary to them shall yet without doubt have to face this law of judgment. There can be no doubt that every individual in using his own proper power of will may shape his course in whatever direction he pleases. That passage always reminds me of the Dr. Seuss quote. Anybody know the one I'm talking about? You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can choose you can go wherever you choose or something like that. Very, Actually, very similar to Scripture. So, Ralph, did you know that Dr. Seuss was a great theologian? Yeah, yeah. Doc, Dr. Seuss, he was a great theologian. Get with me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, get with Twain afterwards. He can explain it to you. But... There can be no doubt that every individual, in using his own proper power of will, may shape his course in whatever direction he pleases. So we make those choices. Uh, and then Methodists, uh, those pagans, he does, he's referring to the pagans when he says those, who decide that man does not have free will, 
but say that he is governed by the unavoidable necessities of faith. There's a mouthful for you. Are guilty of impiety toward God himself, making him out to be the cause and author of human evils. One of the big problems you have if you follow some of these false doctrines is you wind up logically uh, being able to be brought to a logical conclusion that says God is the author of evil. Uh, and, and that is literally blasphemy. And people don't think of it that way because they don't keep the logic going, as I think of it at least. You know, in other words, they don't uh, extrapolate on out from their position to what, what else it might mean. But if God is choosing arbitrarily, then there's, there's nothing else you can arrive at uh, if you keep, uh, keep thinking uh, through the logical uh, process and results there. So this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Uh, one of my favorites uh, in the Old Testament for making this clear. And of course, you remember, this is the occasion in which they're about to go into the promised land. And Moses is given on the sermon. It's amazing how many times that happens in the Bible. But Moses is giving him a sermon. And, you know, he's on one mount. Others are on another mount. And the people are in the valley in between. So why did God do it that way? So literally, that would be representative of, hey, you choose which mountain you're going to. And so he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose in order that you may live. Yeah. Seems pretty, pretty clear. I don't really think I need a PhD in theology to understand that one. We all know John 3, 16, whoever believes in him, so there, there's your action, whether or not you believe in Jesus. Uh, and then this is one of my favorites in this argument simply because you, you are using a scripture that is often used in a different argument. <laughs> but hey, here's a, again an understanding of the logical consequences of that statement of Scripture. So 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So, Yes, it's a great passage teaching about the patience of God, but it's also a great one teaching us that it's not uh, God's arbitrary decision. If it was, what would be the logical result? Well, what would be the logical result? Though? Everybody would be saved. What is God's will? Everybody to be saved. Everybody to be saved. You look at Titus, uh, the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation. You know, if it's up to God, everybody goes. But he clearly tells us most people are not going. So <laughs> what is the, uh, the disconnect there? The disconnect is you do have a choice. And on your choice rests your eternal destination. And uh, those passages are really clear. And if you get into, well, if you get into most of them and follow that doctrine, you blow their mind. Uh, but the, the higher-ups, they're skilled debate theologians, if you will. Uh, they'll take you to faraway lands and castles in the sky on passages like that to basically say those passages don't matter. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to tell you other than what I always say that if we play by those rules then you can interpret the Bible to mean anything you want uh, 
Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say come and let the one who hears say come and let the one who is thirsty come let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So, where's the grace? Well, God provided the water of life. That's the big thing here. But, I might choose never to drink. What's that old saying? You can lead a horse to water? Now, I'm not sure we're not mules instead of horses sometimes, but... It still applies. This is uh, Luther's own statement from the, the will of bondage again. But why should these things be difficult for we Christians to understand so that it should be considered irreligious, curious, and vain to discuss and know them when heathen poets and the common people themselves have them in their mouths in their most frequent use? How often does Virgil alone make mention of faith? All things stand by unchangeable law, and fixed is the day of every man. And if the fate summons you, and again, if you will break the binding chain of fate, the aim of this point is to show that in the destruction of Troy and in the raising up of the Roman Empire, Faith did more than all the devoted efforts of men, from which we can see that the knowledge of predestination and of the foreknowledge of God was no less left in the world than the knowledge of divinity itself. And those who wished to appear wise went so far into their debates that their hearts being doctrine, uh, being darkened, excuse me, they became fools. They denied or pretended not to know those things which their poets and the common folks and even their own consciences held to be universally known, most certain, and most true. Now, I know that's a long passage, but all he's saying is, hey, the world believes in faith, <laughs> therefore it must be true. Uh, that sounds pretty much like the opposite of what Jesus taught. Uh, in fact, I believe he taught that uh, Satan was the prince of this world and it was a darkened world. Uh, so, a logic professor taught me a long time ago that when people are reaching this far to find things to support their argument, it's because their argument is no good. <laughs> And so they got to latch on to anything that has any appearance of maybe supporting their argument. So, so how did the uh, early Christians explain the Bible passages that seem to teach? We'll have to let that one wait. Uh, but Lord willing, next week we will get into an examination of passages like Deuteronomy 30, 19, which we talked about briefly. Romans 9, 16, 2 Peter 3, 9, Romans 9, 18, etc. Rachel? Um, I could see the BBS teachers for a couple of minutes. All right, BBS teachers.